Tonight, we have Molly Peterson here to talk about mosquitoes and ticks. Um, you know, we all we all run into them. I've heard a lot of reports from people about about ticks, especially over the last couple of weeks, and and of course mosquitoes too. Uh, Molly is um, an epidemiologist. She's with the Vector Borne Diseases Program at the Minnesota Department of Health. She's got a background in zoology, so she's fascinated by creatures of all kinds, including pesky ticks and mosquitoes. As an epidemiologist, she educates Minnesotans on how they can prevent diseases spread by ticks and mosquitoes while empowering them to get outside. Uh, studying ticks and mosquitoes takes her to parks and natural areas all over the state. And after work, she can be found enjoying those same spaces to hike, bike, snowshoe, and paddle. So she's one of us. Uh, I'll turn it over to you now, Molly. Thank you, Fran. And thank you, Barry. Um, and thanks, Rovers, for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Like uh, Fran was just saying, I'm one of you. Um, I pretty much spend all my time outside when I'm not at work. Um, and I was lucky to find a job where I get to spend a large portion of my work out in the field. Um, so this really is like a dream job for me and doing this is my favorite part of my job is getting to talk to Minnesotans who also love to be outside. Um, I have a background in zoology as well as parasitology, um, but I really love the human health side of things. So that's what got me into this role. Um, and in some ways I kind of serve as like a medical entomologist because I look at pictures of people's ticks and scabs all day. <laughs> Um, and, uh, like I said, I love to bring my own sort of passion for the outdoors to my job. So, um, I don't have as exciting of material as like Fran's going to talk about next week with her white water trap, but, um, I hope you'll find my fun and nerdy and, um, especially science-based presentation to also be kind of light and fun. Um, I will go through a lot of information. So if it's helpful to write down questions and ask them at the end, that would be really good. Um, and I'm happy to spend some time in either the breakout groups or stay online and answer questions that people have, listen to anecdotes, whatever. So um, I'm gonna share my screen and I have a PowerPoint that I'm gonna kind of just go through um, to help me kind of stay on task because <laughs> I could talk about ticks and mosquitoes forever. Today I'm talking about mainly ticks and mosquitoes just because those are, um, uh, vectors, arthropods that can transmit disease. And since I work at the health department, although I get lots of questions about all sorts of, you know, public health nuisances, fleas, flies, lice, um, ticks and mosquitoes are really the bread and butter when it comes to, you know, disease burden. So I'm going to focus my talk on that, but I'm happy to kind of answer some questions on some of those other things um, if people have them. Um, you know, of course, this is the perfect type of group to care about ticks and mosquitoes, but I always love to preface that this is such a relevant topic in Minnesota. Um, Minnesota has, you know, millions of acres of forest and natural area that Minnesotans rely on for work and play. Um, and what I love, you know, the DNR came out with this amazing study a few years ago that they repeat every decade um, that talked about just how important outdoors and outdoor activity is to Minnesotans. Um, in 2017, they found that, you know, uh, out of 2000 respondents, 93% of people said that outdoor activity is very or somewhat important to them. Um, but that outdoor pests are the main barrier to enjoying the outdoors for more than half of those respondents. Um, and we know that thousands of Minnesotans get sick from ticks and mosquitoes each year. So this is just such an important topic for Minnesotans and especially those that are getting outside. Um, and I also was reading this really great article yesterday, um, you know, the 2021 North American camping report came out and it talked about how there was a five fold um, increase in first time campers in 2020 from 2019. So we know COVID drove people outside um, and many of them for the very first time. And I, of course, have been worried all year while I haven't been able to do my job as at the health department as much as I usually do, you know, how I was missing those people who aren't usually prepared to be outside and keep themselves safe. So I'm super excited to be here today. If anybody's like a beginner outdoorsman, um, I hope this will be really good information for you, but I think it's good for everybody. 
Um, there's a few terms that I'm going to like throw around. And so I just love to kind of preface those. Um, so I don't say something that I'm so used to saying, but you guys are like, I don't know what that means. Um, when I, you know, say disease agent, I'm really just referring to different germs and pathogens that um, we know ticks and mosquitoes can spread and that those disease agents cause disease. Um, vectors are just the arthropods that transmit disease agents. So vector is literally just the way in which a disease agent gets from point A to point B. It's being carried by a vector. Um, hosts can be a whole range of, you know, um, animals, humans, um, you know, um, in, in other parts of the country, amphibians, for, uh, ground feeding birds, all sorts of things can be hosts. Um, and then reservoirs are some of these um, natural hosts that carry diseases naturally in the environment. They don't bother the host themselves um, when they're carrying these diseases, um, but all it takes is a tick biting that reservoir host to pick up those disease agents and spread them elsewhere. Um, I have a great picture of a white-footed mouse here, um, which is the main reservoir for the bacteria that can cause Lyme disease. Just some brief trends about kind of what we see in Minnesota with um, vector-borne diseases. So those diseases spread by vectors. Um, and these disease trends are not unlike other parts of you know, the country, the continent, the world. Um, you know, we've seen that there's an increase in, in where these ticks and mosquitoes are. You know, we see them in counties that I was just talking to a gentleman today in his late 50s, and he said, you know, deer ticks or the black-legged tick, I'll get into that. He's like, that was never a problem in my home county when I was a kid. Um, but we know that these different species of, um, of vectors are moving into new areas and being able to thrive and, and stay there. Um, and so, of course, we see that numbers of people who are being diagnosed with the diseases that those, you know, vectors carry are also going up. Um, and there's also some, you know, things as part of that number two that are also really important to think about, which is, you know, people being more aware of these diseases and seeking medical treatment, um, and then doctors being more aware of testing. And so they're testing and then they're reporting, you know, all those things are um, all sorts of different confounding factors that kind of create this increase of, of case numbers of these diseases. And we also see appearance of brand new disease agents, things that Minnesotans maybe never been used to seeing, all of a sudden we see. So a great example of that would be in the early 2000s when West Nile virus came to the United States. It started out on the East Coast, um, but all it really takes is movement of people and things for these vectors to move into our state and all of a sudden bring new diseases that we're, we've, we've never had. And now West Nile virus is our most commonly reported mosquito-borne disease in Minnesota. So like I said, these trends are, are similar to other areas in the US and certainly globally as well. So I'm gonna start talking about ticks and some of the diseases they carry, and then I'm gonna move into mosquitoes. Um, we have actually about a dozen species of ticks in Minnesota. Um, and people are really surprised by that because we don't come across 12 species of ticks when we're out and about. Um, but the reason being is that most of them just don't prefer to be around people at all. Um, they are very species, um, host species specific. So um, we have in Minnesota rabbit ticks, um, you know, um, scientifically, Haemophysalis leporis palustris. They're a tick species that really just prefers rabbits. Um, if they're unsuccessful at finding a rabbit, they maybe will sneak onto some other hosts, but honestly, they really want nothing to do with anything besides a rabbit. Um, we have similar ones that only prefer raccoons and groundhogs. Um, and so there's really only a few species of ticks that are a public health concern for people. Um, and they're a public health concern because they can, they can transmit disease in varying shades of um, risk level. So um, we see the black-legged tick. I am going to refer to this tick as the black-legged tick because that is the actual name for this tick species, but it is very commonly referred to as the deer tick. Um, there's also the American dog tick, um, which in Minnesota, I, I hear all the time, it's you know the wood tick, a normal tick, a bush tick, a bear tick, like I hear all sorts of things. Um, usually someone's just like, oh, you know, a, a normal tick. And I just know they're talking about the American dog tick because these ones are kind of all over the place and very abundant. Um, um, but it's, you know, name is the American dog tick. So I will probably be referring it to it as that way. Although I feel like I 
kind of get used to calling it a wood tick just because I hear it so often. Um, and then lastly is the Lone Star tick. Um, now this tick species, you can kind of see on the map to the left of all these ticks where they kind of are distributed in the US. Um, and so it's just kind of cusping the southern border of uh, Minnesota. Um, and so it's not a, a tick species that's established here at all. Um, but I definitely get, I don't, I don't even know if I can say sporadic. I would say regular um, submissions, but they're sporadic in that it's only like one at a time. Um, I kind of get them throughout the, the season. Um, you know, I get a nice um, member of the public who wants to call to let me know, or they'll send it in just to um, make sure that's what it is. And it, it always kinds of seem, tends to be in the beginning of the summer, um, end of spring season. And um, I know that we're right along the um, Mississippi River. So lots of migrating birds coming up from the South and it's entirely possible that they started, they stopped to rest and feed um, while they were migrating and it, the tick dropped off, um, found a nice spot that it was okay to stay in and some unlucky person ended up getting in contact with it. Um, so I do kind of get some of those every once in a while. So it's not entirely impossible to come across a Lone Star tick in Minnesota. Um, the one I'm primarily going to focus on today, but again, talk we can talk about the others as well as the black legged tick, only because it's like the main perpetrator of disease risk in Minnesota and disease spread. Um, as you know, the other tick species are are entirely, um, I'll go back up, are entirely, you know, it's possible for them to spread diseases in Minnesota. Um, but the, like I said, the lone star tick is so um, uncommon. And then the American dog tick, although entirely abundant in Minnesota, has a very low um, infection rate in Minnesota. And actually um, that is kind of uh, common across the United States in general. There's some areas where it spreads diseases, you know, more, more often than here, but in general, um, if you were to test a lot of American dog ticks, only about 1% of them carry um, bacteria. So it's pretty rare that you'll actually get infected by a tick, although no tick is a good tick. Um, but in terms of disease risk, the black-legged tick transmits all of the diseases that we know exist in Minnesota um, are often and commonly carried by hosts that live in Minnesota. Like, you know, like I said, the white-footed mouse, um, we see deer, we see squirrels. Um, and if we, you know, I've done some mammal trapping out in the field and we test their blood and we find that they're carrying these diseases in their blood as well and that these ticks are able to pick them up. So I'm gonna focus on the black-legged tick today. Um, and what you're looking at now is um, kind of over the past, oh gosh, almost three decades um, is, the kind of the, the, the timeline of what things look like in terms of reported disease numbers for our most commonly reported diseases by ticks in Minnesota. So Lyme disease, certainly the most common, um, followed by anaplasmosis, and then lastly, babesiosis. Um, almost everybody has heard of Lyme. Um, not everybody has heard of some of these other ones, um, but they're you know also very prevalent in Minnesota. Um, so these are the three most common that we've seen. And like I said, uh, we just continue to see the general trend of going upwards um, over time, although there's obviously some annual um, deviation in, in case numbers. So just some kind of some, you know, biological background on ticks. Um, they're fascinating creatures like any other. I know a lot of people find them completely horrid, but, you know, they, they, they do live really fascinating lives and they have a great ability to survive and thrive. Um, there's, these are the three tick species that we see here in Minnesota, like I said, um, most, um, you know, kind of abundant is the American dog tick on the very bottom of this little ruler picture on the left. Um, the Lone Star tick is in here as well, but like I said, not, not very common at all. And then, of, of course, at the top is the black legged tick. And what's so fascinating about ticks is that they really do have, um, you know, these differentiating markings on them, um, just like you know, you people um, like to look at birds and, and identify different species of birds. Um, you know, it's, you can call it a finch, but there's tons of finches. Um, so what's really cool is that not only do they have different markings across different species, but um, they have different markings between adult males and adult females. Um, and what's really cool about that, and you can kind of go out in the field now and impress your friends, is if you come across a tick, um, adult females, they have a hard shell at the very top kind of that U shape you can see on each of these ticks um, pictures, the females to the far left. 
Um, and that people kind of refer to that, like, you know, hard U shaped shell at the top is like a shield. Um, I hear that very often. And then their, their marking kind of changes down the back. And that's because they have to change from a hard shell to a soft shell um, because they need to be able to expand once they are feeding and um, being in filling with eggs. Um, whereas the adult males, they don't need to do that. So they have a hard shell that goes all the way down their backs. And we can talk in a little bit later about why adult males do not pose as much of a disease risk as the female counterparts. Um, you can also see the um, tick species or the tick life stages nymph and larva. You'll see they have a very similar situation where they have a um, hard shell up top and a soft shell at the bottom. And that's because these two species need to take, or these two stages need to take a blood meal so that they um, can get the energy to get to the next stage of their life. Um, so speaking of that, I worked with my communications team to make this beautiful timeline for a tick life stage and tick life cycle. Um, ticks usually live about two, if they're unsuccessful, maybe three years, but the typical lifespan of a tick is about two years. And this entirely depends on how successful they are at finding hosts, at um, finding a, a mate, um, and, and some of the, the lag time that can happen when they're a little unsuccessful that might extend their lifetime. So in the first year, um, in the spring, we'll see adult um, uh, females, they've laid their eggs and those, those eggs are gonna mature and hatch into larvae. And at this point, larvae are just so small that we don't come across them as often because in their attempt to take their one blood meal that they'll take at this life stage, they're gonna go for low hanging fruit. And those are small animals like mice, ground feeding birds, squirrels, um, things like that. So we don't come across them as often, but if you do come across a larva, it, it's gonna be larvae multiple, and they're, you're usually gonna come across kind of an area where they probably hatched um, and haven't had chance to spread out yet via hosts. Um, and so they kind of look like pepper on your pants. Um, and I usually just take a lint roller and roll them off. Um, they're very small. Um, like I said, you may come into contact with them, but for the most part, they have like, smaller fish to fry, I'll say. <laughs> um, so after they take that blood meal, they're gonna kind of just settle down and wait until they can molt into a nymph. And so you can think of it as similar to um, a, a butterfly um, coming out of its chrysalis after it's molted from you know, a caterpillar and then coming into a butterfly. It does a very similar uh, thing where it molts and it comes back in year two as a nymph. Um, and so nymphs will then try to take their second blood meal of their life cycle. Um, and they're not as picky, so they're still small. So they will still go for small um, mammals, you know, bunnies and dogs, um, but they're a little bit more brave. Um, they're a little bit bigger. So they might also try and find some bigger, um, bigger mammals and bigger hosts like deer people. Um, if they're successful in getting a, um, a, a blood meal and, and finding a host, then they will molt into adult tick. They may come out at that point as early as the fall. Um, I'll, I'll get into kind of um, phenology or activity in a bit. Um, and as the fall rolls around, um, they can have one opportunity in the fall to find a host to feed on, kind of mate with them, in, either a male or a female. If it's a female, she'll lay eggs and then they'll die. Um, adults really just prefer larger mammals. Um, they're big and, and, and they can go for bigger um, hosts. If they're unsuccessful in the fall, then they can try again in the spring and they'll overwinter um, in the leaf litter. And they, in Minnesota, the, the snow pack kind of serves as isolation or uh, isolation, insulation for them. Gosh, I'm like so used to 2020, I'm like isolation. Um, so um, what I wanna point out here on this slide is that during each of those life stages, they take one blood meal. So ticks don't feed very, very much in their entire life, um, but it's during each of those blood meals that they have the opportunity to pick up a disease agent from a host. So when they're a larva, they'll have a chance to pick up something from a host, and then they get a second chance as a nymph to pick something up. Um, so you can imagine that by the time they become an adult, the chance of them being um, infected with something is, is going to be the highest as an adult. As a nymph, They've had one chance to feed, so it might not be as high, um, but certainly possible. So there's lots of misconceptions. I mean, tons of misconceptions about how people come into contact with ticks. Ticks do not jump. They don't have muscular anatomy to do that. 
They do not fly because they don't have wings at all. Um, and they do not fall from treetops. Um, I get, I talk to so many people who are like, they fall from treetops because I found it in my hair or on my neck. Um, and so they assume that it fell from the sky um, or some high shrub. Um, but this is entirely not possible. Um, it's it, there's. We'll talk a little bit about what their habitat is like and where they're likely to be. Um, but something that they do not do is fall from treetops. Um, and black-legged ticks specifically do not see. They don't even have eyes. Um, some species of ticks, like the American dog tick or the wood tick, like I was um, saying, um, they do kind of have like a very primitive eye um, that can kind of just sense like shades of light. Um, but black-legged ticks don't have eyes. So, um, but what they do is that they come up to the tops of these low, gro low uh, growing vegetations like the picture on the right here. Um, for me, I'm 5'2", so this could maybe be like hip height. Um, and they just kind of use these front pairs of arms um, to reach out and sense biochemical cues that are kind of happening in the area. So they have glands on their hands um, called Haller glands that kind of act as noses. Um, and they're sensing CO2, um, vibrations, lactic acid from sweat, things like that. Um, and as they already have their hands out, if something is to walk by, all they've got to do is grab on. Um, so this again, mostly happens near the ground or for someone who's short like me, maybe, you know, hip halfway up your body height. Um, so this is, and I can't get that to go away. This is a um, perfect example of black legged tick habitat in Minnesota. So you're certainly um, likely to come across American dog ticks in this type of habitat as well. Um, but since I really wanna highlight black legged ticks, I wanna show this picture. Um, I'm in this type of environment all the time. I'm sure you guys are as well on your trips. Um, but this is a great area for black legged ticks because it has wonderful canopy cover. Um, it has low growing vegetation and shrubs and it has great leaf litter. You can kind of see in the bottom left corner that there's a little bit of like a fringe, a trail, and you can see all that leaf litter. Um, there's beautiful oak trees and maple trees. So they're gonna create lots of leaves um, and lots of packed leaf litter. And so black-legged ticks are extremely susceptible to death by drying out. <laughs> so this is actually called desiccation. Um, so this is basically like their, their number one fear in life is dying by drying out. So they're constantly trying to maintain their water balance. And what they need in order to do that is humid environment. Um, so you are not gonna come across a black-legged tick in the parking lot of Target. You're just not. Um, in, in, even having a black-legged tick come into your home there's a very limited window for that black-legged tick to thrive and survive because it's just not the ideal environment. Um, just like fish need water, um, you know, black-legged ticks need humidity. And so this is the perfect habitat for it because it's gonna really just pack in and, and keep that um, humidity in there for it. So based on the picture I just showed you, you can kind of predict where tick-borne disease risk is in Minnesota. Um, we see that the ticks are in the woods. Um, and so wooded counties in Minnesota are the ones that we see tick-borne disease cases coming out of. Um, the map on the right is based on um, the three most commonly reported diseases I have shared earlier, uh, Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, and babesiosis, and the number of cases that we see coming out of those counties over a period of like the last 15 years. Um, and so like I said, you'll see it's exactly in those forested um, in those forested areas of the state. You know, Minnesota has such a rich history of logging and um, land development that so much of its natural or original biomes have changed. Um, you know, we see this old prairie parkland on the west side of the state is pretty much all you know developed agricultural land. Um, and in this, you know, the, what we know as the Iron Range and the, and the North Shore area is now a much more Laurentian mixed forest where it previously had been almost completely coniferous. Um, now we see so much aspen and um, we see birch and all these other trees kind of coming in because of logging practices and land development that's happened. And all of those things play a role in where we see ticks in Minnesota. Um, and so since um, uh, the late 90s, but certainly more in the beginning of the 2000s, um, my program has made a very concerted effort to visit every county in Minnesota and systematically look for ticks in areas that we think that they could be. Um, and so this is specific, um, again, to black-legged ticks. Um, 
this year. Um, you'll see in 2019, there's um, just, <laughs> just a few remaining white counties holding strong. Um, we visited all of these counties this year and um, were able to um, mark most of them off as having established black legged tick populations. Now, of course, the um, how, how common it is to come across a black legged tick in Pipe County versus St. Louis County certainly is different. Um, so I don't want to like show you this map and it's like my county's green. You know, I I'm gonna I have the same risk as somebody in Cass County and I live in Mauer. You know, it's very different. And so I wish I had a better map to kind of show you the, how those things those gradients can be completely different by county. Um, but it's, it's really just important to understand tick habitat because then we can understand where they're most likely to be in our home county and know when, when and where we're at risk. So this is a um, tick activity um, kind of graphic that I also worked with my um, colleagues to put together. Um, basically, you know, as soon as the snow melts, um, some of those adult black-legged ticks are willing to come out. Um, I've had calls from, again, wonderful members of the public who want to inform me, and I think that's fabulous because I can't be out there all the time, that they came across a, um, an adult female in February um, because there was enough of a warm up for them to come out. So um, we see them as soon as the snow melts. Um, and then we by kind of about this time of the year, these adult black legged ticks start fading back and we start to see more nymph activity happening. So around Memorial Day, um, into kind of the 4th of July between the holidays is really when I see nymphs out the most. Um, and then again, in the fall, you'll see adult black-legged ticks out kind of having a second little um, opportunity or their first opportunity um, to find a host and mate and things like that. Now the American dog tick or the wood tick, they are like boom or bust. They love to come out in big numbers and they, they, they're they out and abundant for a short period of time, you know, usually just through May, June, and then in July, they just tend to, you know, go away in a snap. Um, so they're, you know, not fun when they are out because I'm trying when I'm out in the woods to collect other species of ticks and I like end up catching so many of them instead. <laughs> so um, they do all kind of just vary in how they, you know, what times of year they prefer to be out. Um, so, um, so with black-legged tick average infection pre prevalence, um, we have about 15 years of data on this. Again, in the early 2000s, my program did, did a really concerted effort to start visiting all these places across the state and establish places that we could sample for long periods of time to kind of get information about um, infection prevalence or, you know, black-legged tick, the number of black-legged ticks carrying different disease agents over time. Um, and so over the past, you know, 15 or so years, we've collected thousands of ticks, um, both adults and um, also nymphs, and we've tested them for the disease agents we know exist here in Minnesota at the public health lab here in St. Paul. Um, and so we've found, um, we have, I'll, I'll even kind of tell you what our sites are. We have um, a site at Itasca State Park. So if you're ever at Itasca and you see some people in white suits in the summer, it's probably me and a couple of my students. Um, we have a um, few sampling sites at Camp Ripley and Little Falls. Um, we also have a site at St. Croix State Park in Hinkley. And we have a site down in a um, Richard J. Dorr Memorial Hardwood Forest, which is um, south of Winona. It's in like the Reno, Minnesota area, if anyone knows where that's at. So we've been collecting ticks. Um, we try, we shoot for a goal of 100 adults and 100 nymphs every year. And again, test them for six different um, pathogens and have been able to get some good information over time about infection prevalence. So um, what I want you to take away from this slide is that about 30% of black-legged ticks, now that doesn't, that includes all life stages, you know, um, nymphs and adults are infected with Lyme disease. Um, but about 30% of black-legged ticks are infected with something. Um, so it could be Lyme, it could be the disease agent that causes anaplasma or babesiosis. Um, we have some kind of varying other disease agents that are pretty rare in Minnesota um, that are all also bacterial. Um, and those, you know, all of those diseases, there's about a 37% chance a tick carrying something. But the best part about um, you know, these ticks and, and disease risk is that transmission time is usually not immediate because we know mosquitoes will come and bite us and fly away, but 
ticks need to stay attached for about two to five days. They're very slow feeders. And it, they're, I always use this analogy. They are not turkey basters. They do not just like shoot and inject, um, you know, disease agent into us like it's a liquid. Um, these diseases and these viruses live in the, in the guts and the tissue of ticks. And it takes some time for the ticks not only to attach and work up saliva to help themselves stay attached to you, but those disease agents then have to work their way through the body up to the glands and then, um, you know, be transmitted to you. Similar to when we share drinks with people um, and it's, it's by, you know, our saliva and then someone else has to come along and come along and drink that. It's not like, you know, we're just spitting on them or something. Um, so with Lyme disease, it can take about 24 to 48 hours of a tick being attached for that disease agent to actually be spread from the tick to us. Anaplasmosis is unfortunately a little bit shorter, about 12 to 24 hours. Um, babesiosis um, uh, takes about 24 hours or more. Um, Powassan virus is because it's a complete, it's a virus, it's not a bacteria like these other ones um, listed here, has very different um, uh, kind of physiology of how it can spread. And um, we actually don't know a whole ton about it, um, but in, in various mice studies that have been kind of conducted, it might be as low as 15 minutes, which is not great, obviously. Um, but if somebody is kind of systematically checking themselves throughout the day, um, again, there's a really good chance of preventing um, these diseases. So you know, that was a lot of information. I wanna move on to mosquitoes because I definitely wanna keep this rolling and make sure I get everything covered that I want to. Um, we're in Minnesota, we know what mosquitoes are. They're horrible, they're everywhere. They bite and they itch. And um, I was at Whitetail Woods this Saturday, um, which is in the South Metro Farmington area. If anybody, I, I know we have some people who aren't from Minnesota here, but for those Minnesotans who may be familiar, it was horrible. I made it about a mile and a half into my hike and had to turn around. I was still in my repellent and everything, but I couldn't handle it. Um, so they're just pretty horrible this time of year. Um, they are a type of fly. They can vector many diseases um, in Minnesota, in the United States, across the world. They're actually the world's most deadliest animal because of that. Um, they can transmit yellow fever, malaria, um, diseases that um, uh, have quite a fatality toll each year across the globe. Um, they do need a water source to complete their life cycle. So that's going to be really important when I talk about prevention later. Um, but it's, it's super interesting to know that we have about 51 species in Minnesota. People just think, you know, mosquito is a mosquito, um, but they, um, we have lots of species of them. And again, they have their preferences. They have their habitats, they have their preferences. Um, so we might not always come into contact with all of them. So this is a mosquito life cycle. Um, again, like I talked about, they do require water. So um, Mosquitoes are fascinating. I keep saying fascinating creatures, but I just think they are. Um, you know, people are so used to them. It's not as sexy a topic as ticks, um, but mosquitoes are so cool in that they really are able to adapt um, to environments and figure, and they're just so smart. Um, so a mosquito, a female mosquito, she will lay her eggs either in water or an area that she knows will fill with water. Um, and so let's say you have a bucket in your yard. Again, we'll talk about prevention later, but she will... Um, lay her eggs right along the wall of that empty bucket at a height that she knows if it rains that those eggs will come into contact with water and be able to hatch. Um, so they can do that in um, areas on the side of the road, like maybe a, a tire dug a kind of a divot in a dirt road. Um, they can lay eggs there because they know they'll fill with water. Um, some mosquito species um, lay their eggs in existing stagnant water that they know won't, you know, rock around and, and potentially ruin their eggs. Um, so sometimes those eggs can hatch within days. Um, and sometimes, um, it may take months depending on, you know, we're having a really dry year, so it could be months. Um, and once those eggs hatch, they kind of go through four stages of being, um, this little furry kind of, uh, worm larvae thing. <laughs> so they live in the water, um, and they can come to the surface to breathe. They use that little, um, it's called a trumpet. It's like a little siphon. Um, they can pierce the water top and they breathe through that kind of like a snorkel. Um, and they kind of feed on bacteria and microbes that are like hanging around in the water. Um, and as they get bigger, they will um, eventually kind of change into this um, pupae, which kind of looks like this alien like chrysalis, um, where they'll um, kind of just take some time to um, morph inside into an, an adult mosquito. And when they come out 
they hang out on the water, they dry out, they harden a little bit, um, and they will search for um, some someone to feed off of, someone, an animal, um, within a few days. They're, they go right away. Um, and so <laughs> I'm like, is anybody gonna get rid of this? Um, in Minnesota, um, our three most commonly reported um, diseases are West Nile virus, um, lacrosse uh, virus, and Jamestown Canyon virus. So I think, like I said, uh, mosquitoes are just like a less sexy topic. So people don't hear about these viruses as often. And we also just have very low case numbers for the most part, unless it's a big year. Um, but you can see how these don't even really have a trend. They're just kind of all over the place. Um, and that is because mosquitoes are so dependent on a water source. Um, so environmental conditions are so important to their life um, that that can really impact how um, big of a year we see with the diseases they spread. So um, talking about West Nile specifically, um, this is a virus that again came to Minnesota in the early 2000s, 2002. Um, it's a virus that affects birds um, in the early 2000s. Um, MDH received lots of birds, uh, dead birds for testing for West Nile. Uh, we have since stopped doing that, which is amazing because they used to get a lot of dead birds. <laughs> um, and uh, what happens is that this uh, mosquito species, Culex tarsalis, um, loves to take advantage of stagnant, dry, hot environments. So the um, agricultural part of the state where we find um, drainage ditches on farms and stagnant water sitting around in crops or water on the side of a dirt road, this is the perfect habitat and the perfect area for this mosquito to lay its eggs. So we mainly see all of our West Nile virus cases in the western part of the state where, again, the habitat is. Now we've seen some kind of creep into the Western Metro, um, but for the most part, um, this is not a mosquito that's looking to take advantage of wooded habitat. It's, it's looking for a very different um, uh, habitat. And so um, this is a mosquito that can lay, have its, you know, hatch from an egg and, and it can actually fly um, miles from where it was hatched. Um, and so this is a species that we kind of keep our eyes on because we want to make sure that, again, as land development and things change, that it's kind of staying where it's supposed to um, and not kind of moving into some other parts of the state. Uh, so lacrosse encephalitis is a really fascinating one. Sometimes um, people have heard of it because there's a really fatal and, um, and terrible case of it somewhere in the United States. We do see a lot of this um, uh, virus happening in, um, in the Midwest, like Ohio and Indiana. Um, but we do get cases here in Minnesota. Um, in fact, the very first case of lacrosse encephalitis um, was in a Minnesota resident. However, she lived on the border um, of uh, Wisconsin. And so she was seen in lacrosse. And so lacrosse got all the glory um, on the naming. So Wisconsin got, got the naming rights. Um, but the first case was a Minnesota resident um, who lived in um, uh, an area outside of uh, Winona, kind of Rochester area, and um, was a five-year-old girl. Um, and she unfortunately um, died and uh, was treated over at Gunderson Lutheran in, in La Crosse. Um, this is a virus that primarily affects children under the age of 16. Um, adults will maybe have a pretty mild illness, can maybe feel pretty sick, but for the most part, we fight this um, virus very well. Um, however, children, um, this, is, this is a disease that can cause cognitive, neurologic, um, long-term issues, and again, can be fatal. Um, so we pretty much only see uh, uh, youth cases with this virus um, when they get reported to the uh, state health department, because again, adults kind of have mild illness with this. So I love talking about this virus um, because it is such a preventable one. The mosquito that transmits lacrosse encephalitis is called the tree hole mosquito, and it loves to take advantage of things that are like its natural habitat, the tree hole. So it has adapted to take advantage of man-made containers, and this mosquito doesn't fly far, farther than a few, maybe uh, 50 meters from where it was where it was hatched. So if there is a lacrosse case, we can visit the house and find containers that were probably holding water and determine that that was the site that, um, uh, that unfortunately caused the illness. So um, we're able to kind of go to the home or the site where they had, you know, the case had been in the last few weeks and we're able to help them remove tires from their property, um, fill tree holes with sand, um, let them know that they need to be emptying their bird baths, their kiddie pools, tying their tarps down. 
um, all sorts of things that I'm gonna get into, um, but we know that this virus is very focal. So, so really good one to kind of talk about and prevent. Last one I wanna talk about is Jamestown Canyon virus. Um, this is a virus that we actually weren't even able to test humans for until 2013. And that's not just in Minnesota, we're not behind or anything that was nationally. Um, this virus is named after Jamestown Canyon, Colorado, um, where the first case was. Um, it's kind of a very, um, I would say, similar to West Nile virus. It can have neurologic effects, um, you know, altered mental status and things like that when it affects somebody, high fevers, um, achiness, um, but it can also be extremely mild to the point that people don't even, you know, it's not worth going to the doctor because they're kind of like, eh. Um, and this, mis this is a spread by a mosquito species um, that take advantage of what is called snow melt pools. So kind of those um, areas in the woods where kind of in the spring, we see those last kind of small piles of snow that won't melt, um, but they eventually do. And they create these little pool, these ephemeral pools that eventually will dry up and go away. Um, and those areas, those snow piles can have mosquito um, larvae ready to hatch as soon as it turns into water. And so we see um, this kind of happening again in some of the forested areas of the state. So for those of us living in the, in the metro, I, I live in Ramsey County, I'm in St. Paul. Um, we do have the um, uh, Metropolitan Mosquito Control District, which does a fabulous job of working within the seven county um, uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul metro area to do um, mosquito control. Um, and after that, unfortunately, coverage outside of the Twin Cities is very fragmented to mainly like research, um, just kind of like some academics who want to do research and um, some small control studies. There isn't like infrastructure outside of the Twin Cities, unfortunately. Um, so in 2017, um, uh, myself and uh, my old supervisor who retired last July, Dave Neitzel, um, we did a, a mosquito fauna survey to look at mosquito species in outside of the metro and see how have things changed since the last publication on the topic came out in the 50s. Um, and we found that um, after collecting almost half a million mosquitoes, um, we had a few no noteworthy findings. We were happy to kind of find that there weren't any um, disease associated species that um, were concerning at, at the beginning, especially in 2017, like the uh, mosquito species that can transmit Zika. Um, that is not one that wants to live or thrive in Minnesota because it is a tropical mosquito. We didn't find it, which was amazing. Um, we have found there's been an expansion of some mosquito species that live in Minnesota. Um, like I said, the Culex tarsalis mosquito in Western Minnesota, we kind of noticed it's been slowly sort of shifting its range. Um, but we did also find that there's, you know, presence of species that are capable of spreading diseases that we know aren't here in Minnesota now, but if it were to come to Minnesota, we have a species that would be competent at spreading that. Um, a lot of people don't know that Minnesota used to be endemic for malaria um, until there was a very swift eradication program by the government to rid the U.S. of malaria. Um, but we have the presence of the species that um, is capable of spreading malaria. So all it takes is the right conditions of people moving in and out, things moving in and out for something like that to suddenly come back to Minnesota. Um, so last I wanna cover is bite prevention. Um, this is of course so important for you guys, um, but I feel like I've given you kind of the background and that will hopefully give you the tools um, when you're outside um, knowing how you can best protect yourself. So knowing when and where you're at risk for ticks, I'm gonna talk about ticks first, is so important. Um, like I said, you're you know walking into Fleet Farm or something, um, ticks are not an issue in a parking lot. Um, the, especially the black-legged tick, which is, you know again, really needing those humid conditions that the woods provide for it. Um, so knowing when and where you're at risk is so important um, to preventing tick-borne diseases. Um, using an EPA-registered repellent I know that people have um, lots of um, you know, preferences on, on what type of repellents they like to use, and that's fine. There's so many great products out there, but what you wanna look for is an EPA registration number, and I will show you a photo of that in a second. Um, that means that your product has been tested, um, approved for safety and efficacy, and as long as you're following label instructions that it should do what it's supposed to do. Um, Checking yourself for ticks daily is so important, especially when um, you know we've talked about those transmission times. Um, so many of the diseases that the black-legged tick specifically spreads um, take at least a day of attachment time. So if you're checking yourself for tick every day, um, there's a good chance that you can just really lower your risk of diseases if 
you know, again, you're pulling it off in time. Um, something that I love to share with people is um, creating that really dry, hum you know, non-humid environment for a black legged tick with your gear. So if you're ever worried about bringing your gear inside um, because of you're worried about ticks hitching a ride on them into your home, throwing your clothing that you wore hiking um, or your, you know, biking um, or your backpack, your socks, your hat. Um, I throw my, my back, my, you know, my pack in, um, throwing that all directly into the dryer when you come in for, um, on high heat for 10 minutes is the best way to just kill ticks immediately. And then you can put it into the washer and actually do the washing, but that high heat and that really hot environment in the dryer is going to kill ticks. Um, if you've got it in there for 10 minutes. So, um, you don't have to worry about maybe leaving them outside. If you'd like to bring them in great. Um, just stuff them right into the dryer. Um, I have a colleague in you know, Illinois who, who put a, a sock full of ticks in a hot tub and a few of them were alive after a few days. So we know that the high hot uh, water won't necessarily kill it, but that dry environment really will. So if you're not somebody who has a dryer at your house, um, I always kind of talk about like the hot box method of maybe putting them in like um, putting your clothes into like a, a sealable tote and putting that out in like the middle of your yard where it's going to get a lot of sun um, or your driveway, um, a parking lot, um, somewhere that someone's not going to steal it. <laughs> um, but again, just to kind of like hot, kind of make that hot, dry environment. So um, removing a tick. If you do find a tick on yourself um, during that tick check, because I know you're going to do them daily, um, you want to remove ticks as soon as possible. Um, I talk to a lot of people who say they wait to go into their doctor because they're scared to do it. Um, again, there's so much bad information online about removing a tick. Um, do not wait to go into your doctor because now you've let it be attached to you longer than necessary. And that is going to increase your disease risk. So do not be afraid to remove a tick. Um, it is not something that requires a fancy tool um, that you bought online or anything like that. All you need is a set of nice tweezers. Um, get yourself some tweezers. Um, and all you want to do is grab as close to the skin as possible. Um, and ticks don't really have a head, but people kind of call them that. So for the purposes of that, I've referred to it as the head. Um, but you're just really trying to get those mouth parts out um, uh, of the skin. You're just going to pull out slowly, gently, you know, don't rip it out. Um, I know some of them can really get in there, but just try and be gentle. Um, you're going to pull directly out and then just clean the bite area later with soap and water um, just to make sure, you know, no infection or anything like that can happen. Um, again, ticks are not turkey basters. So I often, you know, people are like, it's going to, if you grab it the wrong way, it's going to squirt its diseases into you. And that's just certainly not how diseases work. Um, there's also a lot of misconceptions about leaving the head in. Um, once you've removed the body of the tick, which is where that disease um, is being harbored um, in its glands and its tissues, the disease risk for transmission has been removed. The mouth parts themselves um, will work their way out of your skin like a sliver, and it hasn't been shown to um, increase disease risk in studies. So um, if you if you dig in and you can't get them out, it's okay. They will work themselves out. Just make sure you clean up the, the, that bite area with some soap and water. Um, let's cover uh, mosquito-borne disease risk uh, or <laughs> prevention. So you want to create barriers. Um, I don't want to tell anybody to be out in the middle of August in long sleeves and pants, um, but if you can wear, you know, nice, nice light wicking clothing, a head net, um, a hat, things like that, that could potentially um, create a barrier from your skin and mosquitoes. Um, you know, loose fitting clothing is great. Um, but also creating physical barriers within your cabin, um, your RV, um, making sure you've got screens and that there's not holes. If you, if you can patch a hole, that's great. Just really try and create those physical barriers. Um, removing and regularly emptying water from your property um, is so key, especially um, in those areas that we know lacrosse encephalitis can happen um, in kind of that Southeast part of the state. But, you know, mosquitoes love water. So, if you've got a bird bath, if you've got a kiddie pool, if you've got a tarp over some logs, tighten it. Um, really just check your property for things that can hold water. I, I just moved into a new home and I moved in and on the tree line, there's a bunch of buckets in the woods. So you better believe that I went out there and dumped those over and then got rid of the buckets. Um, just check your property and you know you don't need to like be like, oh my gosh, I can't have any containers on my property. You can have a bird bath. You can have a kiddie pool for the grandkids. Um, just make sure you're emptying it like once a week and that'll be enough to prevent 
them from utilizing that. And again, um, I really recommend using an EPA registered repellent. So what that is, is a product that's been registered with, of course, the EPA. Um, on the back of the can by the barcode in the very bottom where it's it's got information about like where it was made and things like that, um, there's gonna be these kind of bold two lines that are gonna say EPA register, EPA reg number, um, EPA's uh, you know, number. Um, so look for that. And if you find that on a product, it could be uh, you know, a more of a bot botanical product or something more natural. It could be DEET, it could be permethrin. Um, just look for a product that has that on it and it, you know, it's been tested for safety and efficacy and things like that. Um, DEET is a great product. That's one that you'll see in you know, Cutter, off Sawyer products, um, but permethrin is a really great one for those of you who are avid woodsmen and, and aren't aware of it. It's one that you don't spray directly on skin, but you actually treat your clothing and gear ahead of time. Um, this is actually the chemical that they use to treat bed nets in Africa um, because it does kill um, ticks and mosquitoes on contact. Um, so it does more than just repel, it, it actually works to um, kill arthropods. Um, so that's going to be one where maybe you'll um, spray your clothing in the driveway um, a couple days before a trip or something like that, let them dry, um, and you can wear them and that'll, your clothes will be treated with that um, through multiple washes, which is also really nice. Um, so just look for that on a, on a product. Um, I always recommend following the label um, and making sure you're kind of washing your hands and, and showering and stuff after you've been covered in repellent. <laughs> I just lastly want to talk about what MDH is doing so that you guys know you can reach out to me. Again, this is my favorite part of my job. Um, surveillance, research, outreach, those are all the things that um, I do. Um, we've got numerous studies going on across the state to look at, you know, tick presence and infection prevalence. Um, we visit people's homes after they've had a specific disease so we can kind of figure out how people are being exposed to things, how it's impacting them. Um, we've got all sorts of other um, research surveys going on. If you ever get something in the mail, um, I would love for you to participate. Um, you can see a picture of yours truly in that, in that right corner. I do lots of tabling um, and things like that. So if you work for another organization and you'd like um, you know, a tick table or something like that, um, I'm always available for things like that. We have lots of educational materials. So um, you might see some of our posters at the state parks. Um, we also have lots of um, uh, five language uh, fact sheets, um, which is amazing, um, brochures, tick ID cards. I did supply Minnesota Rovers with some of these um, materials, so maybe you'll be able to get your hands on some of them. You can also contact me for some of them as well. Um, and the last thing I wanna highlight is tick identification services. Um, if you find a tick and you'd like to mail it to me, um, on our website, uh, you'll see there's a tick identification and submission form. You can mail your tick into me and I'll give you a call and let you know what it is. Um, I pretty much do like five of those a day these, this time of year um, and I'm happy to identify your tick. So um, I think that is good for my time. Um, I'd love to have some discussion, um, take questions, um, but there's also um, some information there if you'd like to call me um, or send an email, so. Thank you so much for listening. Well, thank you, Molly. So uh, I know I have a question, but I give other people a chance first. Anyone have a question? Um, I, I just want to say something, Barry, and that is that Molly did in fact mail me a bunch of materials, including the tick identification cards. And I will bring them to Como when we start meeting in person. So if people come, you can get some of that stuff from me there. Excellent. You should put that out on the e-group too, if you've got enough of them to encourage people to come and get them. And okay. I can send more if they're, if they go like hotcakes, I can send more. <laughs> okay. My question was, I didn't hear anyone else rushing in. So we had someone, we had someone talk to us about ticks before and they said they get on the grass. Now you said, it, I think a little different. They get on the grass a couple of feet above the ground. Mm -hmm. So if you just treat the bottoms, like from the knee down of your pants, then you should be good. But I've been out with treated pants from the knee down and I've had a t-shirt that was out over the pants. Mm -hmm. And then I end up with wood ticks either on my wrist. I had one on my wrist. I had one on the t-shirt. And there's like no way I could get on the bottom of my pants and crawl up and, and get to that 
point. So how high, I know they don't drop out of trees, but how high can they get? Yeah, I, there, I love using this example of a site at Itasca State Park. Um, not that I'm trying to be like, don't go to Itasca State Park, there's ticks and they're high up. Um, but I, there's kind of this like great hazel thicket. And I almost always am able to be in this hazel thicket, which I think is just that perfect area where there's still coverage, where they're maybe a little bit braver to come higher off the ground. And sometimes I'll get them like middle of my upper arm. Um, so for the most part, that is absolutely correct. Um, I know my supervisor, Dave, had, has talked to you guys in the past. Um, I would say a few feet off the forest floor is very common. Um, that's about the, actually the most they move in a lifetime. They don't move very horizontally. It's usually vertically a few feet off the ground. Um, but depending on how tall you are, depending on the habitat, you know, if you're not on a very, um, you know, uh, manicured uh, trail or something like that, and you're really kind of going through the brush, it's entirely possible to find something higher up on your body. And then, you know, some of the um, repellents, they work to do just that repel, but you, they might actually be able to get on your pants and hurry off your pants quick enough that it doesn't bother them. And now you'll find them on your shirt or something like that. And so I myself, as I treat, if I were to use permethrin, maybe I would focus hips down, but I pretty much spray my entire body with DEET. Um, I also, you know, will spray my hands and treat my neck and things like that as well. So it's never a bad idea to, you know, treat yourself instead of focusing. But if you want to really focus some um, of those repellents like permethrin on maybe your pants and your socks and your shoes um, that are more focused on killing on contact, that's also a good approach. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay. Other questions? I have a question about mosquitoes. Are mosquitoes yeah. attracted to, are, I think mosquitoes are attracted to dark blue colors. Is that true or are they attracted yeah. to certain colors? That's true, right? They are. So mosquitoes do see, unlike ticks, I was talking about them, they don't see for the most part, but mosquitoes do, um, if you've ever seen like a show where you see a fly and it's kind of got like this blurry image, um, they can, they sense color. So that's how they're able to find targets. So I usually tell people wearing light colored, loose fitting clothing is great for mosquito prevention um, because that lighter color, colored clothing is less obvious to a mosquito. Um, and then also it kind of doubles as tick prevention because you can find ticks on light colored clothing better. So yes, that is true. Dark blue is what I found that they go after. I, we can see it oh, in yeah. canoes. If you have a dark oh, blue yeah. raincoat on, they come right after you. It's interesting. <laughs> I could see that. I don't know if they know, like, I like blue, but blue is a, is a naturally dark color, even mm -hmm. in its, like, original royal blue color. So, yeah, I could definitely see that. Do, do, you know what col do you know what colors they're attracted to? Or is it all dark colors? It's just dark, dark shades of kind of whatever color that might make it obvious that there's um, some type of moving object that they can swarm to. Yeah. I mean, they don't that seem to be bothered. They don't seem to be bothered by green, just blue. I mean, mm. I, that's what I've noticed. I don't. Know. Okay, I'm, I love it. Maybe you don't, they just you don't. like the color blue, but I know I'm not from. I'm not aware that they like specific colors, just dark shades oh, of color. Oh, you don't. You're not. What about bright colors? You don't think about that, like bright red or something like that. Bright red, a color like bright red would probably be um, better than like a bright yellow, um, just because again, it's a, just a naturally darker color and darker shade. Um, are, but, are, are they um, are they colorblind? No, they they do see color, um, and so I don't know if again a, a specific like orange is better than yellow. <laughs> I can't tell you to wear like an orange okay. shirt or a yellow shirt, but darker shades, brighter shades are just more obvious to them in their eye. What about ticks? a number of questions? Is that, is that true for ticks too? What's that? Is that true for ticks too? Um, well, black-legged ticks don't have eyes, so they're not able to see anything. Um, for some tick species that have a very primitive eye, um, it's more of just those really dark shades that make it very obvious that something is passing. So that would okay. those would have to be much much darker shades. So, Thank you. so Molly, we have a number of questions in the chat. Can you see the chat oh, or do you want me to I read the questions? Can. Yep, I can. Oh, sorry, someone said there was a weird light on my face. I'm in my office, there's a window. <laughs> um, 
So the second uh, question um, in the chat box says, can a person be cured of Lyme disease? So this is a very common question. There's lots of information online about kind of um, the ongoing like battle of Lyme disease information. So um, yes, a person can absolutely be cured of Lyme disease. It is a bacterial disease agent similar to lots of other bacterial disease agents. You know, you go to the doctor for a sinus infection um, and they, you know, might give you a zithromycin or something and it clears away your bacterial infection. Um, so it is absolutely curable. What I think people get confused about and why there's just such bad information around Lyme disease is that some people, if they're not treated early enough, meaning um, it kind of depends, um, usually about 30 days after a tick bite, you might start, start to get what are called late manifestation um, signs of, of, of a tick bite or you know Lyme. So that could be something like arthritis in a knee, a really swollen joint. You can get Bell's palsy where um, your face may droop. Um, people may get neurologic symptoms, um, uh, you know, uh, heart symptoms, all sorts of things. Um, and still at this point, very treatable. It's still a bacterial infection. But what can happen is that you can kind of have some of these long-term, I'm going to use a very scientific jargon word um, called sequelae, which basically just means that you don't have the infection anymore, but you may have like long-term joint achiness, things like that. Now that doesn't mean you currently have Lyme disease. You had Lyme disease, but you have long-term kind of symptoms because you maybe were late to be treated or something like that. And so what that is called is called post-treatment Lyme disease. Um, it sadly has been kind of co-opted as this chronic Lyme disease, um, which makes it sound like you're infected with Lyme disease forever. And that's absolutely not the case. You had Lyme disease, but you just now kind of have some of these long-term symptoms because maybe you weren't treated right away. Um, but I talk to cases, I interview thousands of cases a year. And um, for the most part, you know, people notice those kind of initial symptoms and are, and are people who are like, you know, I'm in the woods all the time. So they tell their doctor that their doctor tests them, they treat them. They feel like a million bucks within a few days. Um, and you can get Lyme um, again and again, because I said, it's a bacterial infection. Um, I, you know, I get multiple sinus infections like a year, sometimes it feels so, um, certainly something you can get again. Um, and at that time it's an entirely new infection. It's not like a, um, flare up. I hear that a lot. It's an entirely new infection at that point. And again, kind of starts, kind of starts over. So, um, that is the first question I saw. Um, I see you treat your clothing and boots or shoes with permethrin. Do you still use this? use a spray um, DEET on your skin? This is a great question. Um, permethrin is used to treat non-skin. So you can double up if you want um, and use permethrin to treat all of your clothing and gear. And then if you, you know, it's, it's hot outside and you'd like to wear a short sleeve, you can use DEET to treat um, your arms and, and hands, your neck um, uh, kind of underneath the base of your jaw and things, you just make sure you keep it out of the eyes. So you absolutely can still use um, a spray on your skin. I have definitely done both um, just because like kind of it's a double up of protection. So um, someone asked if mosquitoes prefer certain smells of a person. Um, so mosquitoes similar to ticks have um, the ability to sense kind of biochemical cues like warmth, um, lactic acid. I know a lot of people talk about being like mosquito magnets. I certainly feel like one sometimes. Um, and things like sweat, um, which are smelly to us, um, also produce lactic acid and things like that. We can also give off carbon dioxide with our breath when we talk. So um, some of those things that may, may smell to us, they're just um, kind of biochemical things that they can sense and pick up. So um, some of those things can be um, mis you know, mosquito attracted. So Maybe you're somebody who talks a lot <laughs> when you hike um, and you give out lots of CO2 with your breath, or maybe you're somebody who's um, somebody who sweats a little bit more. You may give off more lactic acid than your hiking buddy or something like that. And those things can certainly make you feel like you're a mosquito magnet. So um, let's see. Um, I heard eating garlic will repel mosquitoes. I don't know if eating garlic will repel mosquitoes. That's a great question. Um, I'm not entirely sure about that one. That might be one of those like little myths or something that hasn't actually been scientifically tested. So I don't know if I have data to answer that question. Um, 
similar to certain smells, sweat types, do pr mosquitoes prefer certain blood types? So um, with blood types, um, this has been something that's been studied um, and mosquitoes can certainly prefer certain blood types. Um, now that's not just like across the board, um, you know, if you have a certain blood type that mosquitoes might like you more, um, it, that's just one factor in a pile of confounding factors that can cause someone to be, you know, a mosquito attractant. So, um, but it, it has been something that's been studied um, that certain blood types can be more attractive to mosquitoes. Um, now for ticks, cause they also asked about that. I'm not entirely sure. I don't know if I've seen literature on that. So I'm gonna have to say, I'm not sure on that one. Um, okay, um, with tick identification, um, can, ad can an adult deer tick be a fourth of an inch long or more? I thought they were smaller. I was thinking I was only seeing wood or dog ticks. This is a good question. Um, so an American, an American dog tick is certainly very big. Um, and people see those and they immediately are like a tick. Um, and, and then they sometimes see a deer tick and they don't realize that they, they are smaller. They're definitely not the same size as an American dog tick um, or wood tick. Um, but an, um, a, an adult female deer tick can be, um, a, I would say about the size of an adult male wood tick, which is slightly smaller than an adult female wood tick. So they can, they kind of have this like scale of sizes, um, but they can probably be, I don't know if a fourth of an inch, that seems a little big, um, but they, they can be decent size an adult female. Adult males are pretty small, um, but an adult female can be a decent size that you might see it and you're like, oh, actually that is kind of bigger than I thought it would be. Um, so I would say, you know, I guess, I don't know if an or a fourth of an inch is an accurate comparison, but probably similar to what you might think of like a small wood tick. Um, so if you think you're seeing wood ticks and dog ticks and maybe you're like, oh, this one looks a little different, um, pick up a tick ID card um, from Fran and then you can hopefully see how some of the, the markings on their backs um, can make them really easily distinguishable from each other. Um, let's see. Uh, can you just pull ticks out rather than using tweezers? You absolutely can. Um, I've used my fingers to remove a tick. A lot of people just don't want to grab it with their fingers. <laughs> so I totally get that. Um, I touch a lot of them with my fingers. So I feel like I've been desensitized to that. Um, but you can absolutely use your fingers. Um, if you're somebody who maybe has bigger fingers um, and maybe you don't think you'll be able to get down to the skin um, as closely as maybe you could with a set of tweezers, then I would probably recommend a set of tweezers just because you do want to get down to the skin and hopefully pull and remove the entire tick. Um, but if you're out in the woods and, um, and you definitely don't have something on you like that and you see one on you, by all means, just use your fingers to get it off. Um, let's see. You said there was a difference in Lyme risk between females and males. And can you say more about that? Oh yes, I didn't come back to this. Okay, so um, adult males, adult male ticks, and this is a kind of a cross species, but um, it kind of can kind of vary slightly is that adult males are really just finding a host so they can find a lady friend. They are just trying to find a host to mate. So they know that adult females need to find a host to feed because adult females need to feed so that they can get the energy to lay eggs. And so adult males know that's where they find a lady. Their whole purpose in life is to find a lady. I'm sorry, gentlemen. But once they are on a host, they may just lightly hang on because they know the host will move around and they want to be able to kind of stay there. Um, so they may lightly attach. Um, but as soon as they um, kind of sense the pheromones that a female adult um, tick will give off, then they'll just kind of a de uh, detach, go find their lady friend so that they can do their mating um, situation. And then the adult females and the adult males fall off the host at that time. So why that's important for disease risk is that with adult males only attaching lightly and also kind of attaching for shorter periods of time than the females who attach for long periods of time so they can get that big blood meal um, adult males with most tick species, again, um, they are, they're not as much of a disease risk because they're just not on there as long. Um, so those, those females really are the ones that present the disease risk because they're the ones who have to stay attached for, you know, two to five days and can spread, um, disease at that time. So 
that's why there's a little bit of a dis difference between disease risk between a male and a female um, and why not all ticks are created equal. So if you do find a tick and you remove it from yourself, tick identification can be so helpful at that point in helping you kind of determine your disease risk for lots of different things. Um, so I hope that helps and answers your question. Um, yep, someone says I use my fingernails. Um, if tweezers are not handy and then I wash my hands afterwards. And that's, like I said, completely, completely fine. Um, if you're, you know, not somebody who has tweezers in your um, hiking kit, definitely grab a pair and add them to your, add them to your pack. Um, I keep a pair in my fanny pack uh, when I'm doing a little day hike. Um, but most of the time I get home and I'm able to do a tick check once I'm home. So if I find something, I have tweezers at home. But if you're on a long backpacking trip um, and you don't have them handy, fingernails are great. Just make sure you wash your hands after. And then if you get a chance to also uh, wash the bite, that would be good too. Um, is there a way to make ticks come out by themselves? Vaseline, I heard does. So this is a great point. I'm so glad you brought it up. This is kind of one of those like old wives tales, um, similar to burning a tick off or using nail polish remover. These are like three common kind of like old household myths for, um, you know, like tick removal without having to take the tick off yourself. Um, and I do not recommend them. So Vaseline, kind of the theory behind Vaseline is that it like smothers the tick so it can't breathe. Um, but you're just keeping the tick in your skin longer and it's not gonna come out right away. Um, so definitely not something I recommend doing. Um, the same thing is supposed to you know, be said of um, you know, burning it off is, or like heating it up is gonna hopefully like make it come out quick. That's not gonna happen. Um, it's gonna have to work itself out very slowly if it's going to do that. And same thing with nail polish remover or like an alcohol, um, it's again, the same thing. So I definitely um, don't recommend that. Um, someone said heat, yep. So that would be like burning it out, um, you know, holding a lighter up to it to make it hot. So it, you know, backs up cause it's uncomfortable. It would, it would take time doing that. It's not gonna happen right away. So um, it's just def definitely best to avoid using some of those like alternate methods and just doing the old fancy way of tweezers or fingernails. <laughs> um, I know they are less diseases, but can you say something about biting flies? Yes, thank you, Fran. Um, so yes, they're definitely not a disease risk as much, but biting flies um, like gnats and deer flies are horrible. Um, I was getting attacked by the deer flies at um, Whitetail Woods this weekend. Um, in other parts of the country, deer flies can be a vector for a bacteria called tularemia, um, which is um, kind of a, I don't know how to describe tularemia. You kind of get like a really big nasty scab and then you usually get some sort of like infection in that area and then you'll get kind of secondary infection that causes fever and things like that. So tularemia is not great. We usually see a lot of cats that get tularemia because um, bunnies can carry tularemia and they like to hunt bunnies. Um, but so deer flies can be a vector for that disease. Um, in Minnesota, they haven't been shown to really be um, a, a vector for tularemia, um, but they can, you know, deer fly bites can be horrible. They can cause, you know, pain, they can be really painful. They can be really itchy. Um, and they can sometimes cause like, you know, blisters or open wounds. Um, those are all things that if you, um, you know, if you've got a really bad bite, I highly recommend seeing your, your doctor so that they can help you maybe get some type of ointment or um, topical cream to help you um, with that. Biting flies um, and gnats, um, they're also highly dependent on water, um, similar to mosquitoes. So a few, I think 2018, uh, 2019, I wanna say, some of the areas around the Mississippi were really flooded that year and we saw high numbers of biting gnats. Um, they can be horrible, they bite and you'll bleed and it's just not great. Um, but for the most part, they're not a disease risk. Again, it's just one of those things where it's gonna just be painful um, and uncomfortable. And I would recommend seeing your doctor if you um, happen to run into a really gross bat of uh, biting flies. Um, but they, those are also um, flies and deer flies in general are um, you know, arthropods as well. So something that um, using those EPA registered repellents um, should also theoretically be repelling um, and permethrin um, should be killing um, on contact. So using your repellents, um, removing water sources, creating barriers between you, know, you your cabin, uh, yourself if possible, wearing a head net, those things can all be really helpful in preventing some of those annoying uh, biting bugs. <laughs> 
let's see. Um, mosquitoes attracted to certain types of soaps. Oh, uh, good question. Um, I don't know if that's something that's been studied either. Um, again, they can certainly be um, um, attracted to just smells and things that help them kind of hone in on a target. Um, so there can be um, all sorts of smells that I'm sure, you know, make it easier for them to be attracted to you. Um, I don't know if a specific type of soap is, is um, worse than another. So um, yeah, maybe just, I don't know, make yourself as invisible as possible. <laughs> um, do ticks ever burrow under the skin, so to speak, or do they always appear like the pictures with their mouth parts attached and their body exposed? Hmm. Okay, so ticks, um, when they attach to us, it's just their mouth parts that are going to be burrowed into the skin. The um, mouth parts, they basically, what they kind of do is they use them to kind of grab onto your skin. So they'll, let's, you know, this way, they kind of come into your skin like this. And then as they have this kind of third, it's, it's called a proboscis, if anybody's interested in the scientific term, um, but it's basically a barbed kind of probe. And that's like a straw essentially that they use to feed. So the mouth parts will open and like sit against your skin like this with the, um, the um, kind of probe kind of in your skin. And that's what they use to feed. And it's kind of barbed backwards. So that's why when you kind of go to yank them out, that barb can be um, what gets stuck in the skin. So if they're, you know, attached to you, it's just going to be those mouth parts. And then that, um, that kind of feeding um, appendage that is, it's under actually burrowed under the skin. The body will always be fully outside of your skin. So that's what makes it to, easy to kind of go to where a neck would be when you go to remove it. You'll see the body, there'll be kind of the skin and the little neck area. You'll see the mouth parts in the skin and you can remove it that way, but you'll never find a tick fully um, burrowed under, under the skin. They get pretty big. So, um, like a big raisin. So um, being under the skin is not something that would be easy for them. Um, let's see. Um, um, for somebody, non, are there any non-carcinogenic agents approved by the EPA as tick and mosquito repellent? Um, yeah, so there are lots of natural um, and botanical products that um, use um, lemon eucalyptus oil. Um, and they're EPA registered, EPA tested and, and, and safe. And um, you can use products like that if you're worried about something that's more, you know, synthetic chemical based. Um, so you can look for yet yeah, lemon of eucalyptus oil. Um, I have a I have a bottle of it in my, in my um, office that I like to take with me, but um, to kind of show you guys some brands, but I've seen it in a small kind of, it kind of looks like a little perfume bottle. It'll look like this. I just can't think of the brand and it has a little pump on it, um, but it'll say, you know, botanicals um, and it'll say what's in it. And you'll also see it say, you know, natural, but again, just look for that EPA registration number to make sure that if you're going to buy a natural product, that it's one that's still going to work. Is that skin so soft work at all or? It can work. Um, I do see skin so soft in wipes. I see it in lotions. Um, so that's one that um, I also take with me um, as one of those, you know, more natural products. And that can also be one that works. Um, I don't know if that, I think that one is EPA registered. So yeah. Um, let's see. Um, some, some of the rovers have dogs. Um, what about ticks and mosquito prevention for them? Great question. I actually used, I worked as a veterinary technician for six years, which is part of the reason I grew to love, you know, I loved all creatures. And then I found it fascinating that ticks and mosquitoes um, could be so harmful to both animals and people. And knowing your dog is bringing back ticks is a great sign that you were in tick habitat. So um, I highly recommend talking to your vet. There's lots of great um, products out there um, that you may maybe only need to give them like a treat. It, like I'm thinking of um, uh, NextGuard is a product that they can take. It's kind of like a meaty, you know, dog treat. Um, they can take that once a month and it'll protect against ticks and fleas. Um, and then you might have to double up and add something on for mosquitoes because mosquitoes can spread heartworm uh, disease, which is not great at all in dogs. Um, so definitely talk with your vet. Um, if it's something that, you know, monthly might be too hard. Um, there's some that are like every six months. Um, I, I always recommend that people use 
And when I was a vet tech, I did the same thing using products all year round um, because it's hard to say, well, let's end in the fall and start in the spring because sometimes we see ticks in February. So um, I definitely recommend doing it all year round if you're going to do it. But um, I would definitely talk to your vet about what products they have um, at the clinic so you can kind of figure out which one works for you. Um, but being on something like that will be great to making sure that your dog's not bringing ticks into the house. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, is there a certain way to do a tick check? Rub them since they are so small. Um, so with doing a tick check, you know, ticks are going to look for all those areas that they are not going to be bothered. You know, they want to go into our hairline where we're not going to see them um, behind the ears, in the armpits, the belly button. Um, they're going to look for all the areas that you'll leave them alone. So um, look for all of those areas that could potentially be covered. You know, your waistband, um, behind your knees, um, I said armpits, behind your neck, in your hair. Um, those are going to be all of the kind of like hot spots for finding them, but ticks can be anywhere. I, you know, I've had one on the attached here before um, that I got in the car, you know, very shortly after my hike and I was able to take it off because it was barely attached to me, um, but it was under my shirt. So it knew that it could hide there. Um, so a great way to do a tick check is to start at your toes and work all the way up to your head. That's usually what I do. Um, I stand in front of a mirror at home. It's obviously not the best if you're, you know, self-conscious like I am, but if you want to stand in front of your mirror um, before you take a shower, start at your toes and literally work all the way up to your head, checking all the areas, you know, kind of just kind of systematically do one leg at a time, one arm at a time. Um, I highly recommend using um, uh, like a hand mirror if you're out in the field and maybe you're camping um, so that it can help you with seeing things behind your back. Um, uh, behind your knees, um, a little hand mirror, like a little compact can help with that. Um, or if you have a very close friend that you're willing to help you help do a tick check, that's also great. A buddy system is really helpful for tick checks. Um, since some of them can be so small, um, especially like a nymph, it can be about the size of a poppy a sesame seed. Um, uh, really checking everything and really knowing kind of, I have, I'm somebody with a lot of freckles so um, I kind of am like, oh gosh, that doesn't look like a freckle I remember. Um, doing a really, really thorough job. You know, don't rush it. Just take your time and, and check everything. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, uh, let's see. Does sweat attract mosquitoes? It seems like it does. Yes, I mentioned that mosquitoes are attracted to lactic acid um, and that can be something that um, uh, attracts mosquitoes. Um, can you use permethrin on dogs? No, you cannot. Um, permethrin is used again to treat clothing and gear. So it shouldn't be used on, um, on dogs, like on fur. It shouldn't be used on skin, anything like that. Um, can you put, someone said, can you put plastic wrap over open water to smother larva? Well, that's an innovative solution. Um, so I, that's a, I mean, you need a lot of plastic wrap depending on the pond or size, but um, a lot of, um, if you go to, I don't know, some like, I don't want to say uh, like a fleet farm or something like that, where you're looking at mosquito control, depending on how big the body of water is, there are certain products that create kind of a film at the top of the water. And that helps it kind of, um, I guess, kind of like, you know, smother or, um, I don't know, suffocate um, them from being able to come up to the surface. Um, just, it has to be one of those things where you're applying it exactly as it says, um, so I don't know that plastic wrap would work unless you have a, a small area, I guess you could try that. Just don't litter, come back and pick it up. Um, but you can look in stores about, um, for some products that do a good job at covering the water with like a kind of environmentally friendly film that can kind of suffocate the mosquitoes. <laughs> Let's see. Um, someone said Avon has a skin so soft bug guard white product with picaridin. Yep. Picaridin is an EPA registered, um, uh, repellent, um, chemical or product. Um, so Skin So Soft is, like I said, I take those wipes with me. Um, they also have like a lotion and stuff. So um, those can be helpful as well because Picaridin is a good um, um, repellent product. Um, how, do, 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 do. how do we check every part of our body when we can't see every part of our body? Yeah, um, I use a, um, like I said, I use a hand mirror, um, which can be helpful with seeing different, you know, parts of like behind you and your knees. Um, 
again, if you have a good friend or, you know, if you have a spouse or somebody that wants to help you with checking, you know, some areas where you might have to like straighten out and, you know, separate your skin a little bit. Um, definitely just trying to make sure you're getting in those areas, especially those ones that are hard to see because those are where the ticks are likely to go. So um, doing what you can to check everywhere, either again, using a, a buddy system, a hand mirror, um, really taking your time. Hopefully that will help you with that. Um, some persons seem to have more attraction to mosquitoes than others. Is this true? Yes. Um, like I said, some people can definitely be mosquito magnets because um, those can be people who maybe produce a lot of lactic acid because maybe they're heavier sweaters um, or maybe there's somebody that just naturally give off a lot of CO2. Um, those things can definitely be, um, you know, mosquito attractants. So that can, that can be true. Um, someone also said they have a rain barrel. Um, they put a couple of tablespoons of vegetable oil a couple of times in the summer and that helps eliminate the mosquito shoot. Yeah, if you're somebody who has a rain barrel on your property um, and you're worried about it having water accessible to mosquitoes, um, a, an oil would, yes, theoretically kind of coat the top and make it hard for mosquitoes to puncture the, the water surface with their, um, their breathing siphon. So um, that could be something that definitely helps with mos uh, mosquito issues and mosquitoes utilizing that container. Wow, Molly, I think you finally got to the end of the questions. Good. <laughs> I know, am I... questions than anyone has ever done before. That was a oh, lot. Good. I, oh, good. I'm a fast talker, so. <laughs> I was still t typing, but. Oh, so Judy asked if the chlorine level in a swimming pool is sufficient to kill mosquito larvae. Um, yeah, those are going to be kind of unfriendly um, bodies of water to mosquitoes. So swimming pools. Um, that aren't like a, a small kiddie pool um, would be not a good area for mosquitoes to take advantage of. So um, you don't need to worry about a treated um, uh, swimming pool. All right. Okay, I, that was great. That was a lot yeah. of questions. I think I think we all learned a lot. Good.